Hi everyone, so my name is Madison King and I decided to do an oral book report instead of a typed book report. Um, one reason is that my week was nature deficit disorder and so the whole week was focused on how do we eliminate um, the consequences of being indoors all the time for our children and for ourselves and, and be outside and connected with nature. So I'm here on my home place in Callisburg, Texas and this is where I grew up. I have a lot of fond memories um, roaming the woods that are right behind me and then the pasture that's just um, in front of me. My cows are also in that pasture right now, so I keep hearing them moo and um, it may show up on the video, but um, that's part of about, about being in nature. Um, we hear the birds chirping and we hear the cows mooing. Um, there was a squirrel right behind me just a minute ago uh, running along a tree branch. And so this is one of the places that I like to come look for birds just because of the habitat that sits right behind me. And um, it, it's really good for owls. And we also actually the other day saw about a 10 point buck walking right here. I um, mean, it's just about 200 yards from the back of my parents' house. And so I really feel surrounded by nature in this spot. And what be better way to tell you guys about the book I read than sitting in my favorite spot in nature. So the book I read was Last Child in the Woods by Richard Louvre. Um, it is all about saving our children from nature deficit disorder. And I know we talked a little bit um, on the week that we discussed nature defi deficit disorder, um, but the book really goes into detail about um, different places in the United States and how children respond to nature and what happens when they're removed from nature or in nature and how um, how we can better prepare our future generation uh, to save the world and to be better stewards of the land. And so I have some talking notes here um, that I want to make sure I don't get off of too much. Um, so uh, Richard Louvre was the author. This book was actually published in 2005, but then they updated it in 2008 after some research had come through and they had some updated data and they wanted to go back and kind of revise some of the, the book and add in the new numbers. He also put a field guide in the back and some talking points that is specific to this edition. So it really was an expanded version from the original one. Um, so he's written multiple books. He mainly writes on family structure and, and nature, and so this book was a culmination of both things, and he combined his family experiences in with nature. And so he has two sons, Jason and Matthew. Um, he really kind of details some of their stories and their experiences as they were growing up, as well as some of his own. And so it kind of takes you along a journey from how he raised his kids and how they are today. Um, compared with the rest of their generation. And so it really travels through their childhood. Um, and it has some really interesting and funny stories that I won't have time to really go into today. Um, but I encourage you to read the book and, and, and learn them for yourselves and read them for yourselves. Um, so we start with nature deficit disorder. In the 60s and 70s, children played outside really with no fear of what was going to happen. There was no um, fear that they were going to get kidnapped or gunned down or, um, you know, injured. They did get injured, but it wasn't a big deal. It was just one of those things that you went on. Your mom or dad took you to the emergency room because you broke your arm when you fell out of a tree house. And they just took you and got you fixed up and then you climbed trees again. And so today is a lot different than it was in the 60s and 70s. And so... One of the examples that the book gives is Scripps Ranch. And so Scripps Ranch was this housing community that a guy moved into or his family moved into, and they wanted they wanted to move there so that their children had access to nature. And they get there, and the children do, and there's a lot of open spaces. And so they go, and they make friends, and they build these forts, and they have skateboard ramps and, and all sorts of stuff in all of the open play areas. And then the housing authority came through and said, you're going to have to take these down. We can't have these in our open areas. So they did. They took them down. Um, but what they did was they moved them to their driveways. So instead of having them in the open areas, they just kind of relocated them. And their parents put up basketball hoops. And they, they just put the, the skateboard ramps up at the end of the driveway so that they could still play outside and just not be in the, in the open area of the community. And so 
needless to say, the housing community came through again and said, you signed a contract to live here. Um, and this was some of the rules in the contract that you cannot have these things in front of your house. And so they had to take him down. Well, where else does that leave children to go? They had no option but to go inside. They lost their nature. They lost, you know, unstructured play. And they ended up indoors watching TV, playing video games, and um, they lost all of their connection with nature. And it's even criminalized in some areas. That one was that they signed a contract and they, they couldn't have those things outside the front of their house. But there are a few other examples that um, really, you know, you have to have a building permit to build a tree house now. And then one family asked if they had to have a building permit. They were told no. So they built the two-story Victorian tree house that was, um, you know, pretty and nice. And it was their children's kind of um, world away from the world. And they got to go in there and they got to use their imaginations. And so five years later, the city comes in and says, well, it's actually violating a city ordinance. You're going to have to take it down because you can't have a structure, um, a second structure in front of your home. And so they had to tear their tree house down. Um, so it's really criminalized the nature and, and natural play that once was in the 60s and 70s when that wasn't criminal and you built tree houses. I wasn't alive in the 60s and 70s, but I've heard stories for sure. And, um, you know, they built tree houses and they learned things and, um, you know, they, they had friends, you know, all over the neighborhood. And so um, that leads me to one of the quotes in the book from a fourth grader uh, that lives in San Diego. He says, I like to play indoors better because that's where all the electrical outlets are. I have never thought that way. I have always had access to nature and I've never thought I'm going to stay inside because I need an electrical outlet. When I was a child, I rode my bike. Um, I went fishing. I roamed. Um, but I also lived in the country for the majority of that too. And so it was a little bit different than living in an urban city area um, where parents may be a little bit more hesitant to let their children roam outside on the streets where there's cars and, and that sort of thing. So there's these unintended consequences from these rules and regulations that city governments are putting into place. The next point I want to make is the link between outdoor activity and physical health. Um, so overweight adult Americans increased over 60% between 1991 and 2000 and overweight children between two and five years old increased by almost 36% from 1989 to 1999, four times the percent of childhood obesity reported in the sixties. And so in the sixties, when they were outside and they were playing and using their creativity and imagination, um, and they didn't have this structured schedule, the children were, were healthy and they were physically active and they exercised regularly without knowing that they were exercising. It was just part of their play. And so um, when we talk about childhood obesity, there's a couple of different factors that um, professionals weigh into childhood obesity. So the first one is TV and junk food. TV time directly correlates with body fat, according to the CDC. The more time spent in front of TV, the more body, the measurement of body fat a child will have. Another interesting statistic was by three months old, 40% of children watch TV, DVDs, and other videos. So the second part is exercise. And some say, well, children are in organized sports, and that's a form of exercise. And so the weird thing is, is that the increase in organized sports and the increase in, in childhood obesity are occurring at the same time. So if more children are playing organized sports, we should see a decrease in childhood obesity and that's not being seen, we're seeing an increase. And so obviously we're missing the mark on something. They're exercising, but what does that exercise not entail? What is it missing? And experts have come up with that it's missing nature. Children need the unorganized play that organized sports can't provide them. They need to climb, they need to use muscles that they don't normally use and they need to um, fall down and they need to, you know, just be themselves and run in spurts of energy and have those little tiny moments where they're just running as hard and fast as they possibly can instead of knowing when to run as hard and fast as they possibly can in an organized sports environment. And so physical health and nature have a huge 
um, correlation, but we also talk about emotional health. So in 2003, a study was published in a journal, Psychiatric Services, and they said the rate at which children were prescribed antidepressant, antidepressants almost doubled in five years, a 66% increase among preschool children. And so this was before the time where the prescription drugs were even rated for children under 18 years of age. And then um, Prozac, I think, was the one that came through and in 2001, you know, opened the label up to children under 18. And so several studies have found that the more nature surrounding a child's home, the better they are with behavior anxiety, and depression. So several studies followed children, um, and they really found that actually it's more prevalent in girls, and that girls that have a view of nature out of their bedroom window tend to handle stress and anxiety and depression a lot better than, um, than their counterparts. And so there's a stronger relationship in girls, but not to the point of um, it not being significant in, in boys too. And so emotional health, we talk, we hear that all the time currently um, in the news and in, you know, our, our social circles, we hear emotional health and mental well-being being a top priority. And one of those things is that we need to be back in nature to combat emotional health and to have good emotional health. So another part of the book was um, the eighth intelli intelligence. So we've all heard of Howard Gardner. Um, he developed the theory of multiple intelligences. So are you number smart, um, picture smart, music smart, that sort of thing. So he actually revised his theory of intelligences and added an eighth intelligence. So he called it nature smart. Nature smart is not clearly linked to biological knowledge, um, but some researchers have come to to find some key descriptors of how to how to see if a child is nature smart. And so some of those are, do they have keen sensory skills? Do they like to be outside? Um, are they noticing patterns in, an, in the environment? Do they care about plants and animals? Do they scrapbook? I thought that one was interesting. Are they scrapbooking and journaling all of their events and their experiences in nature? And do they care about endangered species? And this isn't an exhaustive list by any means, um, but these were some of the key points that um, the book detailed as being key descriptors of if a child is nature smart. Because I think a lot of our children are nature smart, but it hasn't ever been recognized before um, in the theory. And so actually testing for it and determining if they are nature smart hasn't really happened. Um, but it is on the rise. And so another thing that children learn in nature are life skills. So when you build tree houses, you learn so much about yourself, one, but you learn about measurements. What kind of wood do I need? How strong is this going to be? Is this pulley going to work? Um, how does my ladder need to be? How far away do the rungs need to be on the ladder? Um, you know, what can we do to make this part of the treehouse stronger? What about the floor? How are we going to stand on it? And so a lot of things go into building a treehouse that you wouldn't normally think of, but that a child that's building a treehouse from scrap is going to, by trial and error, figure out. So one of the things that we really learn when building a treehouse is that you fail. You're not going to build the perfect treehouse the, the first time. That's just not going to happen, and you're going to have to go back, and you're going to have to redo something or change the way that you've designed something. So you're learning these engineering principles, and you problem solve. So when you come across something that's not working, you don't just drop it and leave it. You redo it, you pull it apart, you break it into a smaller piece, and then you try to put it back together again in a different way and see if that works better. So our children are learning problem solving skills as they build tree houses and they play in nature and they have these experiences. So kind of going back to mental health a little bit, um, ADHD. So 8 million children, American children, suffer from mental disorders where ADHD or attention deficit hyperactivity disorder is, is the most prevalent. And so families have actually come to realize that their children do a lot better when they're in nature. They're more calm and they have this um, sense of focus about them that they don't, don't normally have when they're in school and they're in an environment that's removed from nature. And so experts are now saying that uh, prescribing nature might, you know, replace prescribing a medication to treat this. 
And so one mom in the book um, takes her son to the park for 30 minutes before school. And she started doing that because they, they just needed to kill time. And so they went to the park for 30 minutes or so, and then would go home or go to school. And so when she started doing that, she noticed this change in his attitude and behavior. And he was, you know, acting better at school and he was focusing more and making better grades. And she related it back to the 30 minutes in the morning spent at the park um, before school. So nature has this profound way of affecting children and even adults. And so, um, One of the really funny things, funny chapters about the book was the one on the boogeyman syndrome. And so, um, you know, fear is what drives most people, especially parents. And I'm not a parent, but I have parents and I know that they have fears when their children leave the house. And, um, you know, when I don't answer the phone um, and they can't get a hold of you. I mean, we've all pretty much experienced fear from a parent, either as a child or as a parent. And so in the mid-1990s, the Children's Defense Fund published this statement, or it was actually in a book, and they said every year since 1950, the number of American children gunned down has doubled. And so they kind of ran these numbers on it, and that was like, if so, in 1951, if two children were gunned down, then 8.6 billion would have been in 1983. 8.6 8.6 billion was two times the Earth's population at that point, which was impossible. It was just this statistic that was almost a scare tactic that didn't really make sense. And, and you think, well, if every year since 1950, the number of American children gunned down is doubled, that's terrible. And it is terrible. And you would hate to hear that statistic. And it would make you scared to leave your house. But the real crazy part is that you're probably more at risk in your house than you are outside. So according to the EPA, um, you face more dangers indoors when it comes to pollution than outdoors. So indoor pollution is two to 10 times worse than outdoor pollution. Um, And that's due to lead-based paints, um, toxic mold, and that sort of thing that grows in your house. And so um, a lot of people used to go on national uh, park visits. They used to take vacation and go to a national park. I've been to national parks and I love them. Um, But families aren't going to national parks that much anymore. And so the national park visits actually were steadily increasing from the mid thirties on, and then all of a sudden um, dropped 25% between 1987 and 2003. And a couple of things I think they think have contributed to this. It's less vacation time on the parents' part. Um, They're just not getting time off from work like they used to. And then when they would take their children there, their children were bored. They, they said that, you know, the, the actual scenery was not as pretty as it was in the pictures. And so they were disappointed when they got there and they didn't get any excitement from being in the national park. And so the family would enhance the vacation with jet skis or ATVs or some kind of other activity that um, really replaced the national park visits. So Enthusiasm about nature is one of the ways that we can reach our children. So they're going to learn through their parents first and foremost or in school. And so when, you know, you as parents or we as parents um, are excited about nature and put ourselves in nature, our children are going to learn through that. The most effective way to connect children to nature is to connect ourselves with nature. And so children, we talked a little bit about them being bored. And so when they're bored, Um, that can be a good thing because it can lead them to that unorganized play or reading a book or being creative. Um, But a lot of children now are more um, numb. They're a numb board and they, they don't get themselves, get themselves out of the rut of being in boredom and going out to do something. They just sit there and, and they say they're bored because nothing else excites them. So what can we do? How can we connect ourselves with nature? How can we connect our children with nature? We can spend more time with our children. We can increase positive adult experiences for our children so that they are not scared and they don't have the same fear um, that parents have today. Know your neighbors. If you're worried about your children playing outside your house, if you know your neighbors and you trust your neighbors, um, you know, they you would feel better about your children being outside um, as, as would your neighbors feel better about them being outside. Use the buddy system. So teach your children that 
you know, when they go outside to go with a group of friends um, and not just go alone. And then technology. So everybody has a cell phone, or at least our older generation has a cell phone these days. You know, make sure your child takes a cell phone with them if they're going to go down the street so that you can contact them if you need to. Um, so just to wrap up, you know, we talked about memories and having memories in nature. Um, your memories are there to stay. You know, kids remember that as they get older. I, I can recall memories um, from when I was a child, and, and it takes me to a happy place. Teach your children healthy boundaries, a love for nature, and independence. And so I want to I want to kind of end here with the last paragraph in the book. Um, it really struck me, and and I wanted, you know, I, I wanted you guys to to kind of um, kind of understand that. And so he says we have such a brief opportunity to pass on to our children our love for this earth and to tell our stories. These are the moments when the world is made whole. In my children's memories, the adventures we've had together in nature will always exist. These will be their turtle tales. And so he related that back to when he was a child and his family would um, rescue turtles off of the highway during their migration. And that was one of his really fond memories um, of being with his family and what made his family whole and together um, and really a family. And so... Um, I encourage you guys to read this book. I was really moved by it. I'm not a parent, um, but I can understand this and I can understand how our children are lacking this nature, um, you know, this nature connection. And so I, I really enjoyed it. Um, I hope you guys uh, choose to read it and enjoy it as well. Thank you for listening. Um, I hope you guys have a great week and a happy Thanksgiving too with Thanksgiving coming up. Bye.